we're now on our campaign. So those are not yet caught up. So we're we're having this uh, campaign named uh, entitled Counterflow: The Way of the Chosen. So if you're new and you don't have a koinonia yet, uh, we invite you and encourage you to join a koinonia because that's where the fellowship happens. That's where um, the most of the um, very intimate and very nice discussions um, happens in a koinonias. And catch up. If you haven't watched episode 1 to 6, it's a very nice series, The Chosen, in episode 7. And we'll probably touching a little bit of episode 8. But before we start our conversation, I'd like to take a poll. Yeah? Ano po tayo? Magpolling po tayo. Just for, just for a moment. Okay? So, um, but when I do this poll, it's going to be a little bit different. Because sometimes when I ask people to raise their hands, I don't know either nahiya lang, hindi raise yung hand, or, hindi tal- or no talaga yung answer. So we're going we're gonna to do it differently. We're going to start with everybody's hands raised. Alright? And then as an answer to the question, you're going to put your hand down. Alright? And then I will see which hand remains raised. Alright? Game? Here's the question. I'm going to flash the question now. Have you ever been rejected? So if you've been rejected, if you have been rejected, put your hand down. So those hands that are remained raised are those who have not experienced rejection before. Whatever kind of rejection, visa application rejection, could be college application rejection, could be job application rejection, insurance claim, even marriage proposal, no. No, I do. No, I don't pala. I don't see any hands raised because if there was a hand raised, I would book a cup of session with you. I'd like to know what's the secret. We all know that at some point in our lives, we have been rejected. We've had that experience of rejection. And it has made us like disappointments. It has given us sadness even to a point of depression. Yeah, and that's, and that's a reality. And when it comes to rejection, right? Rejection. It has also something to do with a disqualification of some sort. Na reject ka. You were rejected because you were disqualified for something. So maybe if it was a visa application, maybe your income was just not enough. Or maybe it was a loan application. Or if it was a job application, maybe you don't have the right credentials. Or if you're being rejected from a social circle, you want to be in, you want to be included, and yet the group rejects you, probably because you just don't have what it takes, maybe, or you won't fit in, or maybe you have done something that was where the other people in the group was or not happy about. So every rejection comes from a sort of disqualification. We were disqualified. Now, the, the serious issue about this mindset with all this sadness and all these disappointments and this depression, the serious issue here is that we think that God thinks the same way. We think that if man rejects us, whose standards are not really that high, then surely... God will also reject us because He is perfect. Diva standards are higher. Men's standard is here. God is all the way there. Sky high. No limit because He is perfect. And it does make sense, right? It does make sense. If man rejects us, if man disqualifies us and rejects us, I think God also does the same. For who is man compared to God? Right? And so our conversation today, we're just going to be tackling about that. We're going to be, our conversation is going to be focusing on that aspect, on how God really sees this situation through the event in what we call the calling of Matthew. And we're going to take from the gospel that bears his name. Yeah? So for those who are taking notes, our, the title of our conversation today is this, Disqualified yet invited. And we're going to take from Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 to 13. This is the part where Jesus called Matthew. 
And, like, and as I mentioned, this is the part, this is going to be um, portrayed in episode 7 that we're going to be watching in the next few days. So if there's one thing that I want you all to think about as we go through this conversation today, it is this, that God's invitation transcends human qualification. Transcends meaning it goes beyond, looks beyond our human qualification. So, let's start. So, we'll start with verse 9. Matthew chapter 9, verse 9. So, as Jesus went on from there, oh, stop. Bigyan muna, tayo na, bigyan muna tayo ng background. I'll give you a background. Jesus went on from there. From where? Alright? So, if you will remember, episode 6, that was two Fridays ago, we were watching um, this scene. Right? This is the, if it's familiar, this is the healing of the paralytic. That's season 1, episode 6 of the Chosen series. So Jesus was already performing lots of miracles coming from episode, uh, the wedding at Cana, right? Uh, his first public miracle all the way to this healing the paralytic. So at this time, Jesus was kind of like getting more well-known in this, in this town because of his miracles that he was doing. And so the setting here is Capernaum. And Jesus was walking by the shore with his disciples behind him or maybe beside him, talking to him. And it's not just his disciples. It will be like hundreds, if not thousands more following him. Because like I said, he's already been like starting to get well-known in this town because he does miracles. And people see it. He healed this paralytic. If you can remember the story in the Gospels, the guy, the, this man was actually lowered down from the roof. Yeah. So here, Jesus was walking, and he passed by this area, and he said he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. Now, let's stop here for a moment again, and let's visualize it. So we have Jesus walking. He saw this man, Matthew. He said, follow me. And, and Matthew got up and followed him. People were there. He had his disciples with him. He had hundreds or thousands of people behind him. And there were also other people there in that area. It's kind of like probably the marketplace. And probably there were also Jews um, settling debts or taxes with Matthew at that point. And now, for this scene to happen, for this situation to happen, if you were a first century Jew at that time, you wouldn't be believing what you're seeing or what you're hearing. They will be in shock. You know why? Because Matthew was a tax collector. And tax collectors were hated during, their, during the first century by the first century Jews. Now you would wonder, how come? How come tax collectors were hated during that time? So I'll give you a little bit of background. So in 63 BC, BC, before Christ, in 63 BC, Rome had besieged Jerusalem. 63 BC by General Pompey. Yeah? This one is a very well-known historical fact. You can Google it after. So 63 BC, Rome besieged Jerusalem, and that was the end of the independence of the Jews. And they had already been made into a client state or a province of the Roman Empire. And during this time, when, when Jerusalem was part of the Roman Empire, the Romans instituted a, what we call a, an op oppressive taxation system. Oppressive, that's a description for how they taxed people at that time. They, were, they imposed an oppressive taxation system so that Rome can fund its ambitions in the area. So naturally, as with any siege or war, there would have been um, collateral damage. There would have been loss of property, loss of life. You know, your relatives could have been killed during the war. It's natural. With war, that's how it happens. And so for, a, for someone like the Jews who were conquered, it would be natural, diba? Right? It would be natural for them to hate the Romans. It would be natural for you to hate your conquerors. But you know what? 
You know what could be worse than a conqueror? You know what can be worse than your oppressors? It is your own fellow men, your own countrymen, or your own kababayan, kabayan, your own kababayan who works for the enemy. That's worse than the oppressors themselves. You cannot contain the hatred that you have for your own countrymen whom your countrymen have been killed, you might have lost properties and everything, and yet you go and work for your oppressors. That was Matthew. Those are the tax collectors. Or in other, in their, in other translation, they called publicans from the Latin word publicanus. You know, working for the enemy, working for the enemy is one thing, and people can hate you for that. What's worse than that, even much worse, is how the tax were collected at their time. So I'll give you a little bit of background of how they did that before. So in this whole province, right, you can imagine the whole Jerusalem. Think of it as your own city back home, in your hometown, wherever it may be, right? And, and Rome will divide your province into different barangays. Yeah, barangays, youth, you might not know what barangays are, but, you know, little, little districts, I would say. They would dis de describe it into, well, they will cut it into different territories or barangays, and they will put it up for bidding. The Roman government will put it up for bidding. They say, okay, from Bukit Batok, because I'm from Bukit Batok. Okay, Bukit Batok district. I need a million dollars for Bukit Batok district. So they're going to bid, starting at one million. Who's going to bid for Bukit Batok? One million worth of taxes. Then these guys or the people they work for will come. I'll give you one million. Then another guy will say, I'll give you 1.5 million. Oh, I'll give you two million for Bukit Batok. I'll collect two million worth of dollars in Bukit Bato. Sold. Okay. Matthew, you get Capernaum. So they will, there's like a bidding system that happens. And so, what the tax collectors do, they will collect those taxes in order that he can pay for what he promised Rome. And of course, he has to put something on top in order so that he can profit himself, right? Because he has to make money, right? And they're very well known, they're very well known, that the money that they put on top of it, as if the, tax that, the taxes that Rome is asking is already very like, heavy, the money they put on top is also very oppressive for their own gain. So definitely people will hate the tax collectors and the publicans at that time. So I cannot find a... Probably there's no equivalent of that type of relationship or that kind of hatred these days. I'm not sure, I'm not sure. But let's try to picture it this way. Maybe you have a president or a leader of a, of, a, of a first world country, and it is publicly offering a job to a very well-known corrupt politician who have served time in jail for corruption and is also facing charges of additional corruption charges. And people would be surprised. What? This is what was happening when Jesus turned to Matthew and he said, come follow me. You can imagine the crowd's surprise. But then while all of society on these days have already turned their back on Matthew, Jesus does the opposite. He called Matthew to be one of his disciples because God's invitation transcends human qualification. No matter how people have already disqualified Matthew from any social circles, you know, the tax collectors at their time, they were not even allowed to enter the synagogue. They were not allowed to offer gifts into the temple or offer sacrifices in the temple. They're not even allowed on courts to bear witness or have a testimony because they have already lost all credibility in the eyes of the people. But Jesus did the opposite. He called Matthew, the tax collector, as one of his disciples. And you know what's more interesting? It's how Matthew responded. You see in the verse that Matthew got up and followed him. In Luke chapter 5, he's named Levi. So it's the same person, Levi and Matthew. In the book of Luke and Mark, he's, um, he's called Levi, the son of Alphaeus. And Levi got up and he left everything and followed him. So what do you think Matthew left behind? So during his conversion, when Jesus called him to follow, follow me, he left everything. So you will say, when you say leave everything, what did he leave? So do you know what this guy gave up to follow Christ? 
So Bible scholars believed that Matthew was actually a customs agent who was um, stationed in Capernaum. Customs. So I'll give you a map. So this is Capernaum. I'm not sure it's very clear, especially from those from behind. This is Capernaum on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. So they were fishing in this area. This is Capernaum. And you will see up the upper right ha- corner, there was uh, Damascus, one of the biggest cities in, in, in those days. And here are what you call the seaports in Mediterranean. So you will notice that the Capernaum here was situated along the great trade route between these two. So and if your customs, so every time a merchandise passes by, tax. Every time something passes through your toll gates, tax. So you'll imagine that Matthew was leaving behind his source of wealth, his source of comfort that he has been enjoying for many years. He was leaving all that behind. And because he was a customs agent, he was in Capernaum, right? He's situated in the great trade route between Damascus and the Mediterranean seaports. And so you, you can see that Matthew was doing business in a very prime location. And Matthew, at this point, you know, he was, he was, he was giving up all of this in favor of following Christ. So the question now for us is, here's a question. When you decided to follow Christ, did you also leave everything behind, like Matthew? No, I'm not talking about leaving behind your properties and go on and live as hermits. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about your old life, your old bad habits, your old lifestyle. Did you leave that behind? Maybe you said, Lord, I want to commit my life to you. What lang pumuna this area of my life, Lord? Lord, I want to give you my life. I commit everything to you, Lord, except for these secret affairs lang muna. Or I want to commit everything to you, dear God, except for this not so honest businesses that I'm running right now. Well, I hope that's not the case. So we go back to our text, okay? So, so as if inviting one tax collector wasn't scandalous enough, right, during that time. It's really scandalous. Jesus was saying, hey, Come with me. Follow me. If that wasn't so scandalous enough, you know what Jesus? He, Jesus even went further. So the next verse says, While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. So maybe Matthew was so happy. Yay! May koino niya na ako. I have a koino. He's so happy he threw a party. Matthew had, obviously had a big house because he was rich. But then we know, for now, we know now that Matthew did not have any friends. He was socially outcast. So guess who will turn up? Sino mga friends niya? His fellow tax collectors. Right? Makes sense, right? And then, and then of course, not just the tax collectors, all those other also who was socially outcast during his days. The sinners. So they threw a big party, and of course, because it's the party of a lifetime. Like, you know, it's it's the rich man's party, it would have been a big banquet. And that's how Luke actually describes it. Matthew threw a big banquet, a great banquet for Jesus and his disciples, together with the tax collectors and sinners. And so, if you have a very big banquet full of corrupt politicians or full of corrupt people, that would be an eye brow racing event, right? People will definitely notice. Kasi may disco eh. May disco dun. And so, of course, it caught the attention of the Pharisees. So when the Pharisees saw this, they asked the disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Imagine that's how much they hated the tax collectors. Ibang category yung tax collectors. Ibang din yung sinners. Hindi man, sila, hindi man lang sila kinumbayin. Tax collectors and sinners. That's how much they hated them. But anyway, so ito, during this time, laki marites yung Pharisees, the couple, Pharisees and marites. Pare, sees, the pare, sees, and the mare asks, anong latest jan pare? Diba? Laki marites ang Pharisees. Of course! Ang laki-laki ng party eh. And so he asks, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? 
And you know what? I don't think in the hearts of the Pharisees, I don't think they were asking this question to get an answer. I think this was an accusatory question. And maybe in their hearts, they were already thinking, this is something that the people will definitely agree with us because everybody outcasts all these people. So definitely the people will ask, see, see, your miracle healing rabbi, what you call so-called rabbi, is having a dinner or having an event with these tax collectors and sinners. Maybe in their minds, that was it. And you know what? It could be true. Because this right here is a counterflow moment that Jesus did. It was a counterflow moment. It was not something that people were doing at that point, or people would not even dream of doing at that point in time. Because no one wants to be even associated or be caught chatting socially with a, ta with a tax collector or with other sinners for that matter. So maybe in their hearts, they were saying, ito na talaga. now I can trap Jesus. Now I can trap Jesus. And then, you will ask me, hey, Brother Steve, what's a big deal? Ah? What's a big deal? I also hung out with other people not so respectable. What? We don't only hang out with the very, very good people. What's the big deal about that? Okay, in order for us, what I, in order for us to understand what's happening here, is we need to go back and understand the cultural context of this event. What is the cultural context? You know what Jesus did? Jesus was not just hanging out with the tax collectors and sinners. He dined with them, right? Is it a loading moment? Like, so what? He dined with them, so what? Okay, so here's the little background of this. Why? Because at, for the first century Jews, eating together meant a deeper and more intimate connection. Even until now, di ba? Koinonia natin, tinatawagan natin kainonia eh. Because that's where people fellowship. That's where people really have, can in, have a very enjoying time together, the eating. So for the first century Jews, it meant a deeper and more intimate connection. Why do you say that? Because of the way that they dined during the time. So when they go for dinner, when they go to dinner, they would say, you know, they would have reclined, they would be talking, they would be drinking. And the way that they did it, there would be a bowl in, in the center like a few large bowl with the sauce. Gravy yan. Tawag sa Filipinas, gravy. May gravy yan. And then how they would eat is they would dip the bread into that sauce and eat. Right? You know me, I like to demonstrate, right? I would have wanted to demonstrate that here, but I would be grossing you out. So I, wouldn't, I, I chose not to do that. So they would dip and then eat. Sarap nito. Bread. Eat, dip. Ganun. Kakain sila. Right? And that's how they did it. I mean, remember in the upper room, when Jesus had this last supper, he said, he said, the person who dip in this bowl, the fingers in this bowl with me will be the one to betray me. And that's why it was a very painful betrayal because it was very personal. So that's how they ate. So can you imagine? Dip. Wala pong restriction before. There was no bowel double dipping, triple dipping. They just ate. And you know, during, in their culture, bawal nga makipag-usap eh. Ito pa kaya? Deep and deep and deep, eat, deep and eat, share, share. The sight that they were beholding right there is almost like seeing Jesus condoning, compromising, being one with the tax collectors and sinners. That's what was happening. Or at least that is what the Jews were perceiving to be happening. And so if there is something if there's something that we could sum up in all of this that's happening in this event, it is this, that Jesus was comfortable being around people who are not up to standard. This was the counterflow moment because it was the time when people really stayed away from those who had already outcasted. And yet Jesus was the one trying to bring them together. Jesus was comfortable being around people who were not up to standard. And so, alam naman si Jesus, bionic ears then. Of course, he's not bionic ears. He's God, right? So he knows what's in the hearts of people. So on hearing this, Jesus said, 
It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Every time Jesus says this line in the Gospels, go and learn, he's actually saying, go back, open your scrolls, because this refers always to the Torah or the, the, the Bible at their time, the scriptures at their time, and learn what does it mean. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. If it, it were the modern day, so in SQ na setting, parang sinasabi lang yan na tawagan mo si Pastor Mike, attend ka ng BPI, basahin mo tong verse na to, balikan mo ako. Try to interpret it according to how it should be interpreted, balikan mo ako. Hopefully, you won't be asking the same question. Mag-BPI po tayo. At least when we read something, right? We know how we, how, how we should be reading it, the Bible. But Jesus was actually quoting here, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, comes from Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. And this is the verse itself. For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, an acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. This was the, uh, the, the verse that Jesus quoted. And, and because this is the response of Jesus to the Pharisees, so this must be something very important. So we're going to spend a little bit more time here. So let's talk about Hosea for a moment. And why did Jesus quote this one? What was Jesus trying to say? So let's go back to the historical background. Say Hosea. Who was Hosea? Hosea was a prophet. Yeah, so he was one of the 12 minor prophets. I don't know why we're called minor. Yeah, pero pwede naman silang sergeant prophet. Pwede naman anong mga ranks nila. Kasi before them was the major prophets. Diba? So um, Hosea is positioned in the Bible right after Daniel, the last of the major prophets. Prophet. So he's the one and the first of the 12 minor prophets. And if you'll recall, Hosea is the one who was commanded by God to marry a prostitute or a promiscuous woman named Gomer. So ito si Gomer was well, known in the ta- was well known in town to be very promiscuous. And they had children, right? Three of them. And then even in their marriage, even despite having children, Gomer still left. She left Hosea. For other men. And then God commanded Hosea to go and reconcile with your wife. Of course, Hosea's heart was brokenhearted when Gomer left him. And probably that would have let Hosea say, Dapat iwanan ko na to. But God said, No, 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 no. no. Go and reconcile with your wife. And when he went there and tried to reconcile with his wife, turns out, yung See, si Gomer was already in debt, probably in debt, or in the possession of somebody else, that Hosea had to buy her back. Had to buy her with money back. She na yung owner, she yung asawa eh. she was, He was the husband. But he also had to buy her back in order to bring her back to him. And I think this is going to be a familiar story because this is also a foreshadowing of God's salvation for us. But that's but that's how God commanded Hosea, go and be reconciled with your wife. And this was the, the, the whole theme of the book of Hosea, if you'll read it. Yeah, probably there's not one in your Hosea or the minor prophets will not be in your radar. The, the 12 of minor prophets starts from Hosea all the way to Malachi. Yeah, those are the 12 before the New Testament. But this is like a, um, like a summary of the book of Hosea coming from uh, Charles Swindle. So, because it's Hosea 6.6, 6, right? So it actually it falls on the second half. The first half is what I just described just now. So the second half, you will know that the, th- the theme of the whole book of Hosea is God's faithful love towards His unfaithful people. Just like how God asked Hosea to continue loving his unfaithful wife. And you will see that this is a series of sermons declaring the sins of the people and God's character. And it mod- it's the model of the message as, Hos- as Hosea remains true to his wife in spite of her fidelity. So at least my background na po tayo. Ano po yung, what's the book of Hosea all about? Or who is Hosea? So Hosea's time, at that time, was a time when Jews' devotion to God and morality had already dwindled. And that was because of the cultural corruption because he had so many neighbors at that time, the Assyrians for, Assyrians for one. Yeah, so may na-influensyahan na po sila ng, ng Assyrians. So they had this cultural corruption and instead of worshiping God, they were worshiping the gods of other nations. So 
they came to a point where, you know, they came to a point where yung animal sacrifice, di ba, alam natin may animal sacrifice before, the animal sacrifice just became like, they had the mindset that, oh, God just wants animals. Honey, it's that time again. Time to offer to the temple. Pakikuha ng kambing. Badali natin sa temple, i-offer na natin. Offer to God. Then after that, go back to their usual lifestyles. That's how it, how it was during Hosea's time. And then God said, nope, I'm not having any of that. So God sent a clarification memo through Hosea. And the memo was that one. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Just to be very clear about this, God was saying. And so I asked myself, bucket mercy? Of all the words you can use, bucket mercy? I did a little bit of digging. And it turns out in the Septuagint, or the Greek Bible, the word was eleos which translates the word mercy. But then if you only want to study this, you have to go back to the source, which is the Hebrew, the Hebrew Bible. And so when I checked the Hebrew Bible, ito po yung nakita ko, this one. So this line, for a desire mercy, not sacrifice, is this one insert, uh, inside the box, the blue box. And this mercy coincides with this word. And then I said, what is that word? It's Hebrew. That word is hesed or kesed. For simplicity's sake, let's just use hesed in English, hesed. And this word, you know, in, in, in English, it's, there's no direct translation to the English word for, for this word. You know, there's, you can translate the word kesed 169 different ways in six English translations. And you already know that it's a special word because there's nothing that can really, there's no single word that could capture the entire essence of this word. And so, in 1535, they had to coin the word loving kindness. One word po yan ha, hindi yan, loving space kindness. It's one word talaga, loving kindness. They had to coin that word in order to be, to have a word that closely, closely captures the meaning of that word. I desire hesed, hesed. So, in order for us to have a good um, uh, understanding of this, I'll give you some examples. Take note because we're going to have an exam later. Yeah? Example tayo. So, in the story of Ruth, right? Ruth and Naomi. Remember the story? So, Ruth had stayed with Naomi. Right? After the son, I mean the husband, the brother, and the, fa- and the, and the father died, Ruth stayed with Naomi. Ruth stayed with Naomi not because... Naomi deserved it. It's also not because Ruth owed Naomi something. Ruth stayed with Naomi because of her hesed for Naomi. So it's something that's given. Something that's given because of the giver, not because of the receiver's merit. So that's how it is. That's how you define hesed. So it's based on the giver himself or herself not because of the receiver. So that's one example. Ruth and Naomi. And also true with Ruth and um, Boaz. So that's Hesed. And in fact, God used the same description of Himself in Exodus chapter 34. I am full of Hesed. If you'll remember during the exile series in July, if you'll remember that, we had one with the Israelites. And no, the people were so filled with unbelief, they could not conquer the promised land. Hey, let's go back to Egypt. And God was so angry. He burned with anger. He wanted to decimate the whole entire Israelite um, community. And Moses interceded for them and said, forgive the sin of these people, not because the people deserved it, but because of your great kesed. So Moses was already like, Asking God to forgive them because of His chesed, not because the people deserved to be forgiven. So, so the verse can be read as this, For I desire chesed, not sacrifice. Or in Hebrew, it's not really, I don't want sacrifice because God is the one who instituted it. So I desire chesed more than sacrifice. 
the Jews already forgotten that because animal sacrifice at that time was meant to be accompanied by a broken heart. Supposedly, on your way to the temple, on your way to the temple, you would be together with your animal there. You would already have been reflecting, you know, of the sins and all the mistakes, all the wrongdoings against God, and then you would offer it with God with much remorse and with with repentance. That is how animal sacrifice was supposed to be. But sadly, at that point in time, it was already downgraded to just a religious ceremony. And you see how religion, together with its set of rules, begins to take over where relationship used to exist. Something that could have connected our hearts with God had already been converted into this empty religious practice. And on that note, careful po tayo, mga kapatid. Baka naman, our Lord, I pray three times a day. Breakfast, lunch, dinner. And even when you pray for your food, maybe you're just going through the motions of thanking for the food. Check your heart if you're really thankful. Because as you keep on doing it every single day, baka it's just going through the motions na lang talaga without thankfulness in your heart. So Jesus couldn't Jesus is saying, hey, guys, I have had enough of your burnt offerings of these animals. Don't you get it? What I want is a relationship, not just the burning of animals. I'm not after that. Remember, four chapters before, chapter, uh, before this text, Matthew chapter 5, sabi nga ni Jesus, if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled with them. Then come back and offer your gift. Jesus couldn't make it any more clearer. It was not just about the sacrifice. It is not just about your religious practices. It's not just about the set of rules that you need to abide with. It has to come with a heart. It has to come with something from the heart that has it. The Pharisees were so fixated on the rule to remain clean, ayang nilang makipag fellowship, that they forgot what is more important the human need for mercy, love, and concern, which these tax collectors and sinners at that point in time needed. From here, you already know, and it's very clear Jesus' message that God's invitation transcends human qualification. So this group of people who are disqualified already by people to be nobodies, God sees them. And God still invites them. So what are the lessons from the calling of Matthew? So while the Pharisees treated people based on their behavior, based on their past conduct, Jesus saw their need for mercy and love and reached out first because of his hesed. Not because these sinners and tax collectors deserved it, but because of his own character. And you know what? This is for us Christians. Sometimes, you know, if we are very honest, right? If we're very honest, we are even the first ones to separate ourselves from people. Kasi nga, Christiano tayo eh. Chura pa lang, scammer na. And if you think about it, all these people who think differently from us, all these people who look differently, who dress differently, who have a different lifestyle than us, if we, are, if we Christians are not the people who's going to introduce them to the love of God, who will? If it's not God who fills the void in their hearts, guess what's going to fill there? What, what it's going to fill inside? Nothing good for sure. And that's why this one is for us too, for Christians. And for all of us, Jesus chose to eat with sinners because they needed to know that they are not beyond God's reach and love. Jesus doesn't require people to change before coming to Him. He extends grace in current circumstances. He didn't ask Matthew, Matthew, tumino ka muna. Come, follow me. Then follow me. No. He said, Matthew, Come. Follow me. And as we end, I have this question. 
What are the past burdens that you're still carrying? Is it adultery? Go talk to David the king. Is it lying and deception? Those, those four fathers had that. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob knew a little about that. Is it anger issues? Oh, Jesus' inner circle, Peter, James, and John, still fit into God's plan anyhow. Or maybe you say, oh, if I've had a string of bad relationship choices. The Samaritan woman at the well knew what that was like. And yet God sent Jesus to have a special message just for her. Watch out for that in episode 8, two weeks from now. Beautiful scene. So maybe today it's your turn. It's our turn. Jesus has a message for you. And it has nothing to do with your qualifications or how other people think of you. But it does have to do with coming to the end of yourself. Because that's when God can use you so greatly. And Jesus, by His grace, His grace, and nothing that any one of us can offer, comes and says to you, Come, follow me. And that is my encouragement for each and every one. How do we respond? We should respond to Jesus' call. When Jesus said, come, follow me, we follow Jesus. You know, Jesus was never constrained with human opinion or approval. He did not make his decision based on like, what other people think. Jesus did not let social status or cultural norms dictate how he related with people. Jesus was saying, none of you are beyond redemption. Whatever it is that you have done in the past, turn your hearts to me and you'll have a new chance at life, a second chance. Follow me. You know what's so beautiful about Matthew? It's because we read in this life of Matthew on how God redeems him, how God changed him, how God restored him, no matter how far that he had fallen. And there's beauty in it thinking that this, this Matthew, this tax collector, this sinner, was invited by Jesus and he followed wholeheartedly. And he knows how it began, he knows how it ended, and he's writing this down as a testimony for everyone, for you and me, to tell us that no one is beyond redemption. We are within Jesus or God's reach. I mean, you may think that you have made mistakes in the past that have hurt others. You may think of the times you know, the, the things that you have done that makes you still sick to your stomach, thinking about what you did and the damage you've left behind. But Jesus comes and tells you, come to me, follow me. You have a second chance. Don't think about what other people think. I accept you because of my hesed.